It's a true pleasure to introduce my dear colleague, Professor Dirk Lang, as one of our plenary speakers. Dirk is an internationally recognized liturgical theologian whose life and scholarship sing with faithfulness and creativity. His ministerial experience has covered a wide spectrum of activities, but all under one umbrella, liturgy in the midst of the lives of people. He has lived innovation through a long season as a brother of Taizé, one of the most influential religious communities of our time. During the 80s, he worked as a part of Taizé's partnership with prayer groups in the Eastern European underground. During the early 90s, he was engaged with developing and leading the prayer and songs of the Taizé community that we all have grown to love and which we'll sing together this evening and tomorrow evening in evening prayer. As a scholar, his creative research and writing rereads classical theological texts through the lens of liturgy, trauma theory, and, wait for it, post-structuralist literary theory. <laughs> you don't have to know what it is in order to feel the impact, and it's actually present without footnotes even in what he'll cover today. In his 2009 book, Trauma Recalled, he explores a new language for Martin Luther's Eucharistic hermeneutic and liturgical theology. This book and his many scholarly and popular articles have won Dirk a wide audience among theologians, pastors, deaconesses with, with whom he works yearly, and among the broader church. Dirk and I came to Luther Seminary in 2008 as a new team to teach worship. We had both received our PhDs from Emory University and studied with the liturgical scholar there, Don Saliers. While influential in his own right, Don also has a famous rock star daughter, Emily, one half of the duo, the Indigo Girls. We've occasionally suggested that the two of us are the Indigo Boys. <laughs> Well, on, on one level, this is humorous, but on another level, it points to Dirk's deep commitment to collaboration, lending his gifts to serve our common work through team teaching in almost every course that he's taught at Luther, with me many times and with a remarkable number of our faculty. He lends his gifts to the church as well, speaking, preaching, leading worship, consulting with friends, former students, and more. Among the many reasons, I conclude with one crucial reason why we need to attend to Dirk's voice in a complex and changing time for the church. He speaks of a gospel attentiveness to the neighbor, making sure what we do in worship as church is not just to please ourselves. Yet that gospel attentiveness does not merely notice the need of the neighbor and respond. No, he narrates the disruptive and yet merciful presence of a God who responds in the midst of our world, in the midst of our worship, in the midst of our need. Dirk, it is an honor and a pleasure to welcome you. I'm looking for the real Dirk Lang. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, Chris. That uh, collaboration is also, of course, mutual. Uh, the joy that Chris and I have uh, teaching together is really uh, large, and um, uh, I think we do a good job. <laughs> one of the stories, talking about class, uh, one of the stories I always tell uh, my students from the time that I was a brother of, uh, in the community of Tizé concerns worship and change, worship and a time of change. Many of you are probably familiar with that community, an ecumenical monastic community in southern Burgundy that has revitalized the practice of communal prayer for the whole church and welcomes visitors by the tens of thousands every year. You certainly know most of the music, uh, or a lot of the music of Taizé, songs like, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, or 
ubi caritas et amor. If nothing else, uh, they make wonderful fillers for Holy Communion when you don't... <laughs> when, when you don't know how long the distribution is going to last. Um, however, there's a whole community behind those songs. It was founded in 1940 by a man who became known as Brother Roger. Early on in the life of Taizé, he wrote the rule of Taizé, uh, stating, never resign yourself to the scandal of the separation of Christians, all who so readily confess love for their neighbor and yet remain divided. Be consumed with burning zeal for the unity of the body of Christ. You will have noticed that Brother Roger didn't write that the scandal of the separation exists because we confess love for God, but remain divided. Rather, he wrote that we confess love for our neighbor, and yet remain divided. He is recalling for us in very direct terms the admonition of John in his letters, those who say, I love God, and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Well, immediately this community began attracting many visitors, young and old. They were attracted by the fact that, well, here was a Protestant monastery. Who had ever thought that would happen again? Um, that was a novelty in itself, but also because this community had such a rich and uh, intense life grounded in communal prayer and in silence. Brother Roger employed a gospel metaphor to express the character of the prayer, that of land, of growth, of agriculture. Through the regularity of communal prayer, he wrote in the rule, the love of Jesus germinates in us, we know not how. The communal prayer of the community was distinctive because it was also aesthetically very fine-tuned. Father Gelino, a very well-known Jesuit uh, uh, composer, had written the primary elements of the liturgy for the brothers. People were drawn into this prayer um, that reflected through the music, through the chant, the range of human emotions as they are named throughout the liturgical year. People were drawn to the simple and serene beauty of this prayer that was always also an ardent intercessory prayer for the world, for the sister and brother whom we see. The community became a major pilgrimage spot primarily because of the simplicity, because of the simple authenticity of its communal life that came, that came particularly to expression in its worship life. At one point, as more and more people started streaming to the hillside on which Taizé was located and that little Romanesque village church was getting too small to hold them all, the brothers had to ask themselves, can we continue welcoming all these people? Initially, they, were actually be, they actually began sending them away. There was quite a struggle to discern what God's will was for the community. Should the brothers stay at Taizé, or should they literally flee for the mountains and find a new location, somewhere that would be much more difficult to access and stop the flow of constant visitors? That was a serious question. Very serious question for the brothers. They even had been offered some empty, an empty Cistercian monastery up uh, in the Alps. Um, I probably wouldn't have found my way there. Um, should, the, should, should the brothers stay at Taizé or leave Taizé? If they remained on the hill at Taizé, it would mean giving up anonymity. It would mean that the life and rhythm of the community would be determined by the ever-growing influx of young people. As one older brother much later said to me once half ironically, if you thought you were coming to a monastery to find peace and quiet, think again. Uh -huh.
After much prayer, the brothers realized that they had to answer the knock at the door. Even if this meant that their vocational path, as they had imagined it, would shift considerably. One cannot welcome the stranger without being transformed, changed oneself. I must note here something. The people, young and old, come to Taizé not because of the prayer of the worship style per se, but because in that worship, in that communal prayer, a space for the heart and community are nurtured. The many words and images and, and stimulations that the world uh, uh, offers us and by which we are too often defined are like stripped away and a space opens up to a deep intercessory prayer of the Spirit in each person. I know this was my own experience that I can recall uh, precisely to the day and hour as I entered that church and the prayer began, feeling as if I had been all of a sudden in a cold shower. Everything is stripped away. And this prayer sourced in the Spirit is carried together communally. It opens up towards the other. The prayer recognizes the world around it. The prayer opens a space, a silence. It points to God's continual work in the world, God's promise, new creation. As the community began welcoming, where was the change first felt? Well, in worship, of course, that most public place of our theology and witness. How could the brothers continue to pray the beautiful French chant that Father Gelino had composed for them? They began to wonder, how can we have everyone participate in the prayer, especially considering that they had to deal with 20 to 30 different languages present at any given time. How can worship invite all these people in? How does worship encourage this full participation? As they pondered this question, one brother realized that they could sing simple canons like the Jubilate Deo by Michael Pretorius, the great uh, Lutheran composer. Then they began searching for other short, repetitive songs, but were largely unsuccessful, so they turned to Father Jalino, who in turn sent them to another French composer, Jacques Berthier, and thus began what has become known as the Taizé songs, these short, repetitive, well-crafted songs, primarily based on psalm texts or other scripture texts. My point the community was willing to let go of one particular expression of worship in order to allow a new expression to arise. In fact, I would say even more radically, the brothers were ready to adjust, to change, to innovate on the very thing that had given them their identity and popularity, their worship. They were ready to let go of that which had defined their identity. But they actually never did give up on the old. The beautiful French chant would be placed at very strategic places in the liturgy. It echoed the origins in a new context. And in fact, the new songs were harmonically and stylistically deeply rooted in those first psalmic melodies that Father Jalino had composed for the community. <clears throat> this always calls to mind for me what Luther wrote about song in worship. We don't separate the styles, we hold them together. Just as Luther called upon artists of his day to compose contemporary German hymns, he also advocated the retention of some older <clears throat> forms. Let the chant in the Sunday Mass and Vespers be retained. They are quite good and taken from Scripture. Old and new together. <clears throat>
But back to Taizé for a moment. Take note of another thing. The development of this beautiful prayer, the emphasis on contemplation, the search for a new musical style was never a goal in itself. It was never dissociated from welcome, from an attention to the need, the cry, the call of all those seeking God. It was never dissociated from the tensions that exist in the world. The call to prayer was always a call to remain in a certain dynamic, a dynamic that allowed the brothers to respond freshly to all the new challenges in the suffer around them in the suffering of the world. This attention to the world and its suffering, its yearning, its cry, all brought to the cross, to God's mercy, was at the heart of worship at Taizé. This attentiveness to the other played out in many ways than just liturgical. As more and more people came, the little church, as I said, became too small. A bigger church was built. It looked like a concrete Noah's Ark, to be honest. It would hold about 1,200 people. Brother Roger always thought it was the ugliest thing around. But this too soon became too small. So a wall, and then another wall was removed. Then tents, and then prefabricated barracks were added to expand the church as needed. It now can hold 8,000 people. It was this spirit of provisionality, not being constrained by even concrete walls or extremely well laid out plans that has inspired many, including many Christians living and working in the underground in countries like the former East Germany under communist rule. Recently, on a visit to Erfurt in, in the former East Germany, I met with someone I had worked with during the 1980s in that underground. Probst Heino Falke was sort of the official theologian for the bishops and the church in East Germany, forging a path uh, through his writing and thinking uh, for the church in the midst of a socialist state. He said to me that the flexible and innovative character of the church was symbolized for the people, for the East Germans, in the constant rebuilding of the church at Taizé. When there were too many people, the walls were simply broken down and expanded. The impetus, he said, must come from below, from somewhere else. And then he pondered, can our churches be such places, such symbols of hope, beacons of provisionality? The impetus comes from below, from somewhere else from the unexpected, from perhaps the stranger knocking at the door. The radically different neighbor is the one who sets the table and who will shape the community. But there is more here as well. The provisionality with regards to one's own self-identity is to, an ex to a certain extent an openness to the reality of death in all life. Even the welcome, the stranger at the door signifies for us a judgment on who we think we are. The neighbor always challenges those identities we self-construct, but that welcome and that judgment is not met in fear, for in that daily dying, we know as baptized people that the Spirit works, raising us always to new life. This faith engendering provisionality knows that the God of life is always stronger than death and in fact has this habit of rising from the dead. Yet isn't it 
too often the case that our worship actually closes the door or fortifies the walls, reinforcing patterns inherited from the past or perhaps inculcated by cultural milieu. This tendency is known in the most classic and common response given in discussions about worship. But we've always done it that way. We can hear this response made in reaction to change in any context, whether so-called traditional or contemporary or contemplative or relaxed or emergent or whatever else type of worship. We fall too quickly back into maintaining our self-determined identity. We prefer to avoid judgment. We avoid dying. Even when in our worship we think we appeal or connect to the sensitivity of the worshiper or seeker, I believe we need to ask another question. To what extent is our worship limiting the horizon, closing the worshiper into their own expectations, exerting even a certain power over an individual's emotional landscape? To what extent are our words and music, and perhaps especially our music, focusing the worshiper on the self rather than on the community? and on the neighbor? Is the novelty experienced, um, is the novelty experienced in, in, in a small circle or gathering or group of worshipers only reinforcing the walls, creating self-contained communities, look-alike communities? In such a scenario, it doesn't matter what style of worship is engaged. People just won't come. The young people didn't go to Teze because of the worship style, because, but because their deep need was heard, welcomed into the prayer, transfigured in community. They experienced judgment and new creation, death and life, these two held together. The world, the world of simple narratives, of easy meanings, of finite symbols, of simple correspondence between need and satisfaction, of power dynamics, this deciphered world with no empty spaces gave way at Teze to silence. In worship, are we opening this space of silence or are we just filling in, fabricating something like creating a new medieval convent-like structure, new self-enclosed communities turned in upon ourselves. Martin Luther ponders the same question, and his answer directs us, I believe, to that continual disruption of all things. As soon as we think we have God in our midst, as soon as we think we've created an experience or an encounter with God through worship, in our almost gated-like ecclesial communities, whether that worship happens in pews or chairs or couches or as in Teze on the floor, as soon as we think we have God in our midst, we are surprised to find God always outside the circle we just built, outside our doors. As is common for Luther, he puts, he likes, you know, when he writes, he likes to put words in God's mouth. Uh, <laughs> I've never had that audacity, but we'll give it to Luther. Um, so listen to, to, listen to God speak as Luther heard. Nevertheless, God says, I do not choose to come to you in my majesty and in the company of angels but in the guise of a poor beggar asking for bread. You may ask, but how do you know this? Christ replies, I have revealed to you my word, what form I would assume and to whom you should give. You do not ascend into heaven where I am seated at the right hand of my heavenly Father to give me something. No, 
I come down to you in humility. I place flesh and blood before your door with the plea, give me a drink. Instead, you want to erect a convent for me. Instead, we want to build distinct, unique edifices according to people and their tastes. Instead, we want to cater to a need of immediacy, to a desire for momentary, dominical or sabbatical, Sunday or Saturday sensation. Instead, worship becomes like secondary literature, endless commentary on the moment, something like a communal blog with endless entries headed nowhere. Instead, worship becomes just a lot of chatter. Is it possible for worship to rebuke that opportunity, that desire for immediacy? In order to approach uh, those questions, something that we will be doing together over the next uh, three days in workshops and plenaries and panels, and primarily here in worship, when we ponder what makes worship today such a challenge, when we ask why are there so many different forms, so many alternate, alternative expressions of worship, when we ponder how can worship speak to people, both the churched and the unchurched, I believe we need to begin with a very simple realization. All worship, no matter what form or style, all worship is constituted by rituals. I realize that may sound obvious. I realize also that this may not be your first instinct when uh, you think about worship. Uh, uh, most commonly when we think worship, we think sermon or music. We think organ or praise band or pulpit. And yet even these, the singing and the preaching, are inherently ritual. They occur at particular moments. They are prepared. They echo what has gone on before and they serve what follows. They are part of, part of a rhythm embedded within the pattern of worship itself. The music and preaching are rituals making up the larger ritual of reading and praying, confessing and forgiving, holding arms up and hands outstretched, sitting and standing, turning and greeting and embracing. All these rituals and many more shaping us, forming us into some type of community that is more than just a community of ears or mind, but a community that connects mind and heart and body. Ritual addresses the whole person in that deep Hebraic sense. Ritual addresses the soul and body as one. The confessors, particularly Melanchthon and Luther, understood this rightly. In the Apology of the Augsburg Confession, uh, Article 13, on the number and use of sacraments, we read, the word and the right have the same effect. The word strikes the ear and the eye, it penetrates both the heart and the body. The word as oral event may tell us a story, but the rite, the rituals we engage, the sacraments do far more than simple narration. They engage us in an event. Yes, of course, ritual also tells a story. Rituals can tell diverse stories, as you know. Sometimes they're more about ourselves uh, and how we imagine God. Ritual creates meaning for a group or reinforces meaning prev prevalent in the culture around us. But the, call to the, but the call of worship, the rituals we engage, also resist, oppose the two easy meanings found within our society. The rituals of Christian worship resist the ways in which a society or a culture will try to invent its own meanings for life and for God. For example, in the meal we share together, the meal that we call Holy Communion,
forgiveness of sins is given, but that forgiveness is embodied. It is a body. And then this discovery, this body, is also the body of my neighbor given to me. Forgiveness invites us into a different type of life in community. We are given in this right to each other, Luther says. The sacrament is communion, a real fellowship, a sharing of all possessions with and for the neighbor. It is not simply a Jesus and me moment. The ritual of this sacrament exercises us in a deep human reality that we are not just individual isolated minds, but that we are bodies together forming a community. The sacrament invites us into a dying to self and a life for others. The sacrament, this ritual, outlines an economy for us contrary to the economies of our society. With this recognition, we understand that worship is telling a story, but it is doing far more as well. If worship were just to tell a story or teach a narrative, even a biblical one, then worship may simply just be telling a historical story. One, as Luther notes, people quickly forget. He also notes that simply knowing the story is something that the devil does much better than we do. <laughs> the whole point, of course, is that the devil doesn't understand that the story is for him that it is an event engaging all of us directly in death and in life. Worship, the whole liturgical event, moves us deeper into the story as event. It moves us deeper into the for you. Worship begins in scriptures, but it is not secondary literature or just commentary. As we can read in the Lutheran Confessions again, ceremonies should be observed, both so that people may learn the scriptures and so that, admonished by the word, they might experience faith and fear and finally even pray. The rituals of worship engage us in an event we are admonished so that we might experience faith, that is, so that we are gripped by faith, confronted, disputed, transfigured by faith, so that in this experience we fear God, that deep awe and dependence on God alone, the fulfillment of the first commandment. And all this brings us to another activity which in many places for Luther, defines us as human beings. And finally, it brings us to prayer. Proclamation is event, not just story. Worship enacts, continually enacts this event. It attempts to express something of the inexpressible, to say something about the unsayable and it does so primarily without words. At the heart of this event, at the heart of worship, is the Christ event itself. The Christ event is depicted for us in this beautiful stained glass window as a passage. We use a metaphor to speak about Jesus Christ, that is, we use a figure of speech, something that distorts speech, something that simple words cannot say, something that says God cannot be said with just one word. We use the image of a lamb, the paschal lamb, one of the images we use. Christ is the one who has lived among us, was killed and is now raised to life. This passage from death to life is the event at the heart of worship Worship liturgy then is trying to translate this event for you.
for each of us in community. It is taking the Easter story and making it true today. Worship holds this paradox that both life and death are affirmed in this world, that death, in fact, is part of life. Does not the baptismal font at the entry of a sanctuary continually make that claim? Or is death sidelined in worship as in much of our culture? What does our worship translate for those who come in? And for those who don't come, who show no interest, is worship and the, community it's, and the community it shapes such that those people might say, wow, something unique is happening there. I better go and see. The translation of this paradox of death and life held together, judgment and new creation, deconstruction and promise, this translation happens not just in words, as in a sermon, but in actions, in gestures, in prayer, in thanksgiving, in lamentation, in song, in distribution, in embrace, in sending. Now if worship is translation of the Christ event, a translation meant to engage us in that event, invite us into that pattern, into that passage, into that paradox, then we must take note of something peculiar to translation. In fact, we know it sometimes as the bane of our faith experience. So many translations, always new translations. Why can't they just leave that hymn alone? <laughs> Which version of the Lord's Prayer are we using now? Why does translation cause this dilemma? Because translation is a continuous, a repetitive, even responsible act. Translation recognizes the fact that context and language do not remain static, but constantly change. The words change, meanings shift. When I came back to Canada, yes, I'm actually from further north than I think any of you, um, up in Winnipeg. When I came back to Canada after living in France for 20 years, the world I returned to had changed. The form of life had changed in which words have meaning, and I found myself having to learn English anew. Idioms had changed. I was like a foreigner in my own mother tongue. Worship is a continual translation, and to our surprise we discover that there isn't any set form that works for all times and in all places. We cannot look back to the early church for a model. Well, we can look back, we can study early church liturgies, which I love to do. Uh, we, can, uh, we can try and find out as much as we know, uh, can know about them and glean some incredible insights into how they translated the Christ event in their worship practices. We can also look back to the 16th century and look how the reformers translated the Christ event into worship. But as soon as we think we have found the perfect liturgy, as soon as we think one worship style is the perfect translation, no matter the historical era, we have fallen into the trap of the closed circle, the hermetically sealed liturgy besides also falling into historical naivete. The only one who remains constant is the one who was crucified and raised to life again, Jesus Christ, our Paschal Lamb. And the only pattern that remains constant, at least as defined by our confessions interpreting scripture, is word and sacrament these things in which Jesus has promised to be always present, word and sacrament, word and right, ear and eye, mind and body, proclamation preached and distributed. Around this one reality we translate in worship. Our translation in worship is a constant echoing of God's inbreaking and remaining presence among us. 
God's own death and life in the world and in us. Worship is not a mindless repetition, but a struggle, an ever-renewed witness of this something that we cannot say of God. Worship echoes, it embodies, sometimes silently, sometimes very loudly, that simple truth about God. God is immeasurable goodness. God is all-merciful. This proclamation is worship. According to, to Luther, worship proclaims the glory and kindnesses of God. And writing about our first parents in the Garden of Eden, he states, they would have conversed in their worship about the immeasurable goodness of the Creator. They would have sacrificed, they would have prayed. Worship translates and engages us in God's immeasurable goodness. Isn't this what we are continually called to do? To point to Jesus Christ? Not as a spiritual guru, not as some magical savior, not even as some personal friend, but the one who shows forth all of God's goodness and mercy. Worship then is like a language, both verbal and nonverbal, a language we use to confess the mystery of a life that is stronger than death and of a goodness that is stronger than any evil. In worship, God's goodness breaks through, breaking through the overwhelming flood of words, of polemics, of power dynamics, breaking through the assault of momentary sensation. Worship gives voice, song, silence to God's goodness, God's immeasurable goodness towards us. This goodness, stronger, more radical than any evil, continually calls us into this impossible task of translation. Impossible because God's mercy that is always offered, God's goodness that forever comes to us, Jesus Christ, can finally not be captured, known, represented, memorialized in our worship. That is why we keep repeating it. God is not an idea. God is not an abstract notion of grace or forgiveness that we attempt to understand, but the continual eruption of the Holy Spirit in our midst. And this eruption takes the form of a body, the body of Christ given for you, a real body, a body that resists all of our attempts at control, manipulation, or mastery, a body that resists all our attempts to turn God into what we want God to be. I am the beggar knocking at the door. Give me a drink. God comes to us. God disrupts our patterns of remembering and translation. God disrupts our words and rituals, our celebrations. Word and sacrament are a disruption that reveal to us the depth of our need and the need of the world. And in that disruption, in that recognition that all of worship is in a, in a degree always failed worship, in that lonely spot, the Holy Spirit creates faith. In that place where nothing holds, where no meaning resides, where the deciphered world crumbles, where all self-constructed identities fall by the wayside, God enters in, faith alone. There is the source of our worship. The gospel preached and distributed opens this space of comfort, of mercy, of goodness, from which, in which, Christ is given. The exercise of faith that we name worship, that impossible task of translation, calls, requires, even demands constant renewal. As I have already mentioned, this translation is an ongoing task. This necessity is already evidenced in the simple fact that the gospel is always in dialogue with local community and culture, 
Or put more simply, worship is always attentive to the neighbor, to the one outside our walls. If such a dialogue is not happening, worship can too quickly become esoteric or otherworldly, or it too quickly can start engaging a different story than that of the cross. As people concerned about worship, we will be asking how is the Christ event becoming for us today? It is not enough to change worship styles or music. It's not enough to place a cross in our sanctuary and contemplate it. Such an approach, such empty contemplation, Luther warns, actually affects in us a loss, a lack, a flight, an escape from suffering. Worship, on the other hand, is always to take us to the cross in everyday life, in the community around us, not to the cross as we might imagine it 2,000 years ago. How is the Christ event becoming for us today? There will never be just one answer to that question. Luther was deeply aware of that fact that we can't produce one translation, one style of worship that remains constant forever. Luther, when he began to write about worship, does so very cautiously. Perhaps it is good to recall, as, as we think about change and innovation, how important this worship renewal is, that the Reformation began publicly in the reform of worship practice. Already in the 95 Theses, it was a distorted practice of confession and absolution, the practice of indulgences that was attacked. Then Luther writes the Babylonian captivity in which he dismantles the entire sacramental order. And after that, he, looks, he writes his treaties on baptism and several on the sacrament of the altar, Holy Communion. Luther was very aware of this simple fact, what we do ritually and how we engage worship matter for proclamation, for this embodiment of the gospel. Despite these beginnings, Luther never wrote an order of worship right off the bat. He was constantly being pressured to do so, to write an evangelical order of worship, and for the longest time refused to do so. Finally, in 1523, as you will remember from uh, your time in seminary, uh, in 1523, he wrote the, he revised the Latin Mass. It was a significant ritual revision, but the basic structure and almost all the components of, almost all the components of the Mass remained the same. It wasn't until 1526, so almost 10 years after the posting of the theses, uh, that he composed the German Mass. Why such hesitation? When Luther finally ceded to the pressure and composed the German Mass, he also wrote a preface to the Mass. And in that preface, he notes down all sorts of qualifications about how to use the order he has just written. I want to stop and reflect uh, not on what he wrote. I want to reflect on his hesitation, this reservation, and what it has to say to us as we explore what worship is in a changing world. There is a breadth and a depth to those reservations. I would call it a gospel-like attention. We are all called into this gospel-like attention. First of all, to one another, to our own worship stories, to the stories and experiences that each of you will be cultivating, I hope, over these next few days. No one person or community possesses a set of practices that are universally valid. All our forms, practices, demand negotiation and continual questioning. The first question we always ask is, do these practices translate the Paschal mystery? Do these practices initiate people into the death and the life of Jesus Christ. Luther, as I said, hesitates to note down how this translation happens ritually because one, he knows that ultimately it's the Spirit's works to use the rites, 
Woe are we if we think we can contain the spirit in one form. And two, he realizes that every local community is unique in its gifts and in its need, in its death and in its life. He didn't want to establish one order also that might be misused. He knew very well that if he were to write an order of service, of worship, people would appropriate it immediately as eternally valid because it was written by Martin Luther. They would turn it into the gospel itself. They would worship the order rather than, the, rather than being admonished and brought to faith. And of course that is precisely what happened, despite all his warnings in that preface. Even today, we can idolize the form, the rites, above and beyond the event they seek to embody. The first thing Luther writes, this is the very first sentence of the preface to the German Mass to tell you how important this is to him, how much danger he sees. In that very first sentence of the preface, he writes, do not make this into a rigid law. Do not make it into a rigid law. When we study the liturgy, we are not studying a law that must be imposed in the same way in every place for everyone. In fact, when we make it a law, we destroy the whole purpose of worship and the gospel becomes superstition. Rather than proposing a strict order, liturgy introduces, the worship introduces us into some simple biblical things that we use to exercise our faith. Well, on some level, you've all been very well trained in the craft of translation, particularly in preaching. We understand the word as a word preached, announcing the gospel today. The lesson, however, that we have learned from Luther this afternoon is simple. It's not just the preaching, but the entire liturgical event, worship in all its manifestations, in words and rites, in song and gesture, that is, proclamation. The gospel is preached and distributed. The word and the rite have the same effect. They both strike the heart equally. You know, Luther, too, was not the only one in his day struggling with this task of translation in worship. Luther observes that there are, in fact, many who want to develop and implement new worship services, new orders of worship. It's perhaps surprising to us that even in Luther's day there was a tension between what we call traditional and contemporary worship despite all the inaccuracies of that designation, which you have to join uh, Chris Sharon's and my class to learn about. Um, uh, in fact, uh, the, pro the proliferation of new forms of worship was one major issue that propelled Luther to finally propose, compose the German Mass. In some way, there really isn't anything new under the sun. Luther himself may have been labeled contemporary by some, but then he too saw how others understood contemporary differently from him. Luther responds to the multitude of innovations springing up around him in a very simple way, not with condemnation or judgment, but with a gospel-like attention to what is essential. Some, he writes, have the best of intentions, but others have no more than an itch to produce something novel so that they might shine before people as leading lights rather than being ordinary teachers. Worship is about teaching from and to the Christ event. Worship is celebrating, feasting on the word. It is word and sacrament. In worship, we discover the breadth and the depth of God in God's address to us. We discover the breadth and the depth of our own human person in community. God doesn't settle for easy meanings or good feelings. The horizons of our lives 
are deepened. The spirit touches places within us which we never knew existed. Just for the matter of time, I'm going to jump to the conclusion here. I'll end with um, this painting from the 16th century parish in Torslunde, Denmark. As you look at it, you may be struck by a number of things. First of all, you might be wondering why I post a picture of a 16th century worship in a, in a conference on worship and change. Well, because this image depicts something about a theology of worship that I've tried to convey this afternoon. We see in this painting the traditional and the contemporary together. There are the priests in chasubles, and there are pastors in black albs. There are the people, all of them together, the rich and the poor, as we can see by their clothing. There are old and there are young. Social stratas and generations are all brought together in this community. If we could hear this painting, we would probably hear the old Gregorian chant and the new Danish hymns together. But most of all, we notice something quite amazing in this exposition of worship. At the center is a crucifix, but no one is looking at it. Because the crucified and risen one is present not on the cross on a wall, but in the people gathered and the things that they are engaging. The Christ event, our own dying and rising, is present today in the waters of baptism, in confession and forgiveness, in the reading of scripture, in the preaching and the praying, and in the sharing of a meal. In these things, in and with each other, we encounter Christ, both the neighbor in our midst and the stranger knocking. Let's open the door. <laughs>